Welcome to another episode of the Good Listening To Show, your life and times with me, Chris Grimes. The storytelling show that features The Clearing, where all good questions come to get asked and all good stories come to be told. And where all my guests have two things in common. They're all creative individuals and all with an interesting story to tell. There are some lovely storytelling metaphors. A clearing, a tree, a juicy storytelling exercise called 54321, some alchemy, some gold, a cheeky bit of Shakespeare and a cake. So it's all to play for. So yes, welcome to the Good Listening To Show, your life and times with me, Chris Grimes. Are you sitting comfortably here? Then we shall begin. Yes, indeed, and what an exciting, exciting day here in the Good Listening To Show Clearing. We have got a national Trevor treasure, not called Trevor, <laughs> a national, not a national Trevor at all, a national treasure. Christopher Biggins, one Biggins, the Biggins, is in the Good Listening To Show Clearing. Welcome. Thank you very much, Chris. Hurrah, you are a British, I know you know who you are, but just to blow a bit of happy smoke at you, you're a British actor, media celebrity, TV personality and compare, a grand dam or dame of pantomime. You got the best award of all after 50 years in pantomime. In 2017, you got given a Lifetime Achievement Award. And if I may, in researching you, which I've really, really enjoyed, I think you are a, a veritable sofa cushion because you've been a happy appendage to all the sofas of all the national TV programmes of our favourites that we care to mention. I think I first ever saw you in I, Claudius, playing Emperor Nero way back in the day. For years, I thought it was called I, Clav Divs. That's probably because <laughs> I was a bit of a, a school div. You never know. Um, but we've also got other commonality in that we both trained at the Bristol Ovic Theatre School and we both got our first ever job that gave us our equity card with the lovely David Wood. So that's who we have in common. And I'm really, really, really happy to have you here. You happen to be my first recording of 2023, please. Ah, fantastic. Very good. So how's morale? What's your story of the day, first of all? I know you've just come down having played. Um, it's, it's Mrs. Smee in Peter Pan, which you did many, many years ago as well, getting you going on the career of being in pantomime. I did. I, it was very interesting because this year, or rather last year, I was asked about March, I think, quite early on in the year, if I would like to go back to Darlington. Now, why Darlington is so important to me? Because I started my pantomime career in Darlington 46 years ago as the dame. And I did my first dame there for, as Mother Goose. And I then did three years there. I did... Um, uh, Jack and the Beanstalk, and I think Dick Whittington. So that's where I started my career. And first of all, when they asked me, Dougie Squires, who directed, and Jamie Phillips, who uh, was the producer and designer, and uh, Peter Todd, who ran the theatre, they asked me to go to Darlington. I said no. I was actually quite appalled. Because, <laughs> How um, dare you invite me to Darlington? <laughs> exactly. I mean, no, not Darlington. I, I love Darlington, but just the fact that it was pantomime. And to play a dame, every dame, I was 27 years old, every dame I'd seen up until then seemed to be in their 90s. I mean, they were very old men. And so I said no, and I kept saying no, kept saying no, and eventually they mentioned one day money. <laughs> Bearing in mind, this is 46 years ago, uh, in a theatre where the top price ticket was one and six, they offered me a thousand pounds a week. And I thought, a thousand pounds a week. I, I better do this. So I did it. And of course, I fell in love with it. And I've been doing it ever since, apart from one year. And that was when, well, actually two years, but the one big year was when I, I did The Jungle. Yes, and, you you were the, that's when you were officially crowned, not just head of The Jungle, but you were the, the nation's absolute darling from that point on. That was 20, 2007. That's right. I mean, it was fantastic. I mean, I, I love the experience. It was just wonderful. And it was it's very important to me because people say to me, like, I'm thrilled. You mentioned right at the beginning, I Claudius uh, or I Claudius, uh, as we pros call it. Uh, we, because as opposed I, to I Claudius. <laughs> no, no, that's right. But I Claudius was um, a wonderful, wonderful role. And I, 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 I still... 
think of it as probably one of my great roles, uh, except that the following day it was transmitted, I was offered Poldark, the sex crazed vicar, which was another wonderful role that I did for television. But I, Claudius, was just phenomenal. I mean, Nero, I really believe that I was Nero mm-hmm. in a previous life. And I, because I was, everything I had was in so common with him. But it was extraordinary. I mean, I would if I could have been anybody in the in the past in, in the past, it would be Nero. I mean, he was extraordinary. I mean, he had over a thousand servants, uh, and I'd love a <laughs> servants. I can't tell you; it would be so wonderful. And and you play the violin and enjoyed setting things alight and watching them burn. Is that yeah, you know, absolutely all of that? So, no, sadly, <laughs> I don't play the violin, uh, and but I I have an obsession with 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 fire. Um, and I don't know, there's just something about him that I absolutely adored. Um, and he was, it was just a wonderful role to play. But if people say to me now, what is the greatest thing you've ever done? I have to say, I'm a celebrity to get me out of here. Because to win that and to win it by a huge vote yes. was fantastic because you're voted in by the public. Yes. And that is what is so important to me, is the fact that the public took me under their arms and and just uh, engulf me. I mean, it was fantastic. And that's why it was a genuine, sincere compliment to call you a sofa cushion on all the nation, all the nation's favourite TV channel sofas. Because you've been yeah. on so, so, so many. I mean, we don't need to list the programmes, but, you know, having uh, you know, obviously co- done sort of surprise, surprise with Cilla Black. I know that you're greatest, greatest friends with Dean Joan Collins as well. I mean, you, you, it, you're just there as a, as a sort of centrepiece national treasure. I know, I, I don't quite know. I mean, I, I think it's because I love life. That's one of the main things. I mean, I, I adore people and I love life. But when I look back on who I've met and what the things I've done, my career, the, the extraordinary performances that I've given, I'm very, very touched and proud by the fact that I've had such an amazing career. And it's still there. You know, I'm still working. Um, having just finished a, a, a long, well, not a long, but a extensively uh, hard season in Darlington, you know, where we do two shows a day, 12 shows a week. It is tough, you know, and I'm 74 years old now. And so you have to think about the future, about how, you know, are you, are you going to go on? Yes. Yet more pantomimes. And I absolutely won't press you to talk about what the money is nowadays because it must be significantly uh, more than a thousand if it's a, a equivalent of a ticket price of a shilling and sixpence or something. Yes, no, you're right. It is. And uh, so that <laughs> is very nice indeed, you know, and it gives you the comfort to be able to do things and to enjoy life and stay in luxury hotels just outside Darlington called Rockcliffe Hall. Yes. And all of that, which is fantastic. So I'm really lucky. And I grew up when I was between 11 and 19 in South End, and I know you've played um, Dame Smee at South End, I think probably at the Cliffs Pavilion probably as well. Yes, David Hasselhoff. Fantastic. I, I mean, no idea. which was wonderful. I mean, I, I absolutely adored him. He was enchanting, but he was a, such an unprofessional man. I <laughs> you know, in the theatre, you have to be in the theatre uh, by the half, and that's 35 minutes before the show goes up. Well, he used to never arrive on the half. He used to arrive at beginners, which was like five minutes to seven, say. So at seven o'clock, the curtain would go up and he would be just <laughs> arriving. Um, and he was, but he was just wonderful. I didn't mind that at all, but because he was fantastic. I remember he's, I think he's now married this lovely Welsh girl that he had as a, a girlfriend. And uh, he now uh, they're, they're married, but she went out to that was my, it's always my birthday in pantomime, December the 16th. So she went out to buy me a present and she went to Poundland and <laughs> bought me this stuff. And he was furious and he came in and ripped out of my hands these things that she would bought me in Poundland. He said, I've got something much better for you. I'm sending it to America for it. And what it was, was one of those red um, things that you, people save lives in the ocean. Ah, yes, yes, a, a life ring. A life, well, it wasn't a ring, it's a sort of oval shape. Ah, OK, OK. And it, it's very American, and he signed it, which I've still got in my garage to this day. I mean, it, it, he was a lovely, lovely man. I adore him, and, and she's gorgeous, even though she goes to Poundland. I mean, my presumption was he was always late for the half because he was running on the beach circa Baywatch, and that's why he was late, because Southend does have a, well, a beach of sorts. <laughs> The station that makes you feel good. UK Health Radio. 
The station that makes you feel good. It does have a beat. Yes, I hadn't thought about that, but I, sadly, I don't think that was the excuse that he would have given. Uh, quite right, too. Um, also, I know you know this, but your christened Christopher Kenneth Begins, which made me think of Norman Stanley Fletcher, because, of course, you've been in Porridge as well. Yes, I know. Uh, what a thrill. I mean, you know, we never knew in 1974 when we did Porridge that we would be uh, involved in something that would go on to, to this day. Uh, but anyway, it was wonderful to be involved with Ronnie Barker and Richard Beckinsale, who sadly died yes. uh, during the making of it. And, and it was tragic. The whole thing was tragic. But one wonderful, wonderful thing to be involved in. And still for it. I mean, you know, comedy wise, it stands up today brilliantly. It could be could have been made yesterday. I mean, that's the most extraordinary thing about it. Yes. And Ronnie Barker was so generous in as much as if he felt one of his lines written by Dick Clement and Ian Refrene was better said by me or another character, he would give it because he saw the whole picture. He wasn't like most. He was, wasn't a comedian. Comedians take, 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 take. Mm. Whereas he was a great comedy actor and comedy actors give. And they want the whole production to be successful. And that is why Porridge is one of the great sitcoms of the last century, I should think. Yes. And how fantastic to have been there, all those seminal moments of history where Uh, programmes like I, Claudius, Porridge and, and, and were all made. Fantastic. We used to rehearse at the, we used to call it the, the, uh, the Hilton uh, hotel and it was, in fact it wasn't a Hilton hotel but it was a, a rehearsal rooms the BBC had and there were three rehearsal rooms on each floor and on the top floor there was a canteen and it was so star I remember getting in the lift one morning with Morecambe and Wise <laughs> and going hi how are you and they went we're very well how are you and I said fine and we chatted and I got out and thought oh dear oh dear I've no they've never met me I you know I I only know them because they're in my sitting room every Saturday night or Sunday night. And I like the fact you're in a confined space again. I have, in researching you, I really enjoyed your story about the Queen coming to your dressing room, which is the size of a postage stamp, oh. and you being crammed in there with Prince Philip at the door. Oh, that, <laughs> is such, that was such a wonderful moment. It was the 50th anniversary, I think, of the theatre, and I was there doing giving of my puck. In fact, I was the best puck in the park that year. <laughs> and I, uh, but, and, but she doesn't like theatre. Her Majesty, Her Late Majesty. I mean, I, she was, I met her on numerous occasions and I was thrilled to have met her. She was fantastic. But anyway, so I was chosen to meet her in my dressing room, which was the size of nothing. I mean, it was, there was only room for two people in there. David Conville, who was the artistic director, stood in the doorway with Philip. And he said, this is Christopher Biggins, mum, who's playing Philistrate and Puck. And she said, oh, lovely. And I said, well, it is lovely, mum. And I showed her my costumes. <laughs> and, I, and I then said, and these are the greeting cards that people send you. And this is the make. I mean, I was just talking trite. But I thought to myself, this poor woman must have to listen to this day in and day out. And eventually she said to me, and what are those? Pointing to a shelf. So I brought them down. And I said, these are Puck shoes. And she turned to Philip in the doorway and said, look, Philip. Puck shoes, whereupon I screamed with laughter. And there's this wonderful picture of the two of us, her looking very po-faced and me screaming with laughter. But the one thing she did have, well, she had many things, but she had a wonderful sense of humour. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I saw that on, on numerous occasions. But no, I've been very, very lucky. Very lucky indeed. And you gave me a wonderful segue about two paragraphs ago, which is uh, you were talking tripe. <laughs> you were talking tripe to the Queen. So talking of talking tripe, let me bring you in to the structure of the good listening to show where i'm going to talk to you about a clearing a tree an exercise called five four three two one there's going to be some alchemy some gold you're giving me gold by the bucket loader anyway and then there'll be a cake via a cheeky bit of shakespeare and a couple of random squirrels as well right okay and uh, just before we started you went what's all that about so now let me explain so let's get going first of all then the epicenter is the clearing where all good questions come to get asked and all good stories come to get told Christopher Biggins, what is, where is a clearing for you? Where do you go to get clutter-free, inspirational and able to think? You may be surprised at this. and I don't know. I mean, you've obviously interviewed a lot of people. So the answers must be fascinating. But my clearing is my car. Aha. 
And the car is is a Cleary because, you know, I, I used to love driving and I used to love driving uh, um, uh, convertibles. Um, and I, I had my first convertible was a Citroen 2CV, which I absolutely adored, where you rolled the roof back. And then I went on to BMW convertibles, then Peugeot convertibles. And now we have a, a Fiat 500 top of the range uh, convertible, which with an electric roof, which is fantastic. So I've always loved that. And I remember being vividly in, in a my BMW at traffic lights. And, a, uh, and it was the, to the beginning of my career. And uh, I was having a, a, quite a bit, of, a bit of success. And I remember this, this lorry driver looked down at me and he went, oh, hello, lukewarm. How are you? <laughs> and, uh, you know, you thought to yourself, yes, that's it. I've arrived now. I've arrived. So lukewarm was, was just perfect. And then, of course, now I get biggins all the time, which is a, a great thing. I, I love being called biggins. I mean, biggins is the most wonderful name. I mean, it's my name. I haven't made it up. And it sums up me brilliantly, I think. So this is iconic as Biggles, isn't it? Biggins, Biggles. Uh, 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 yes, I know. And you've got Big in, you've got Biggles goggles as well for glasses, which are very iconic on your face as well. Uh, well, I mean, and it, it, it is, but the car is great because I, I love the car because once you get in it and shut the door, you're on your own. Yes. And you can think about things. You can, I listen to Radio 2 uh, always, except now. I used to love Radio 2 in the evenings when I was going home, perhaps for after a theatre or something. Uh, and now Radio 2 is hideous. It's awful. It's good during the day. And I love Elaine Page and I love uh, various, you know, theatrical people who are on it now. But it's losing something. And I hope they don't completely take it away from us because it's always been my uh, go to radio station. I never listen to the radio in the house, interestingly enough. Just in the kingdom of your car. It's just in the kingdom of my car. And, you know, the house, I mad on television so we have televisions everywhere you're you won't be surprised to hear that i got 54 inches in the uh, bedroom and it, it's, <laughs> it, it's absolutely divine. and i i know a lot of people say you should never have a television in the bedroom they're absolutely wrong so that's by the coach congratulate you for the expression i've got 54 inches in the bedroom i love that <laughs> that's fantastic <laughs> So the car is great and you can you can go places, you can uh, you can be silent if you want to. You can think about, you know, what you've got to do. You know, you make uh, memos in your brain as to what to do next. You know, it's it's a great uh, space. Yes. And I, and I, I love it and I treasure it. And I can imagine you not being a, a particularly aggressive or angry driver, just a very at at one at peace well, uh, that's interesting you should say that. I, as I'm getting older, I do get really <laughs> angry. I do swear <laughs> at, ah, wonderful. at other drivers because they are appalling. I mean, I, some of them don't have licenses, I don't think. And they're, they really uh, are rude. And I, I shout at people now. I mean, you know, it's, but it, that's, that's me just a, a funny old age. And by the way, I know that your dad used to run a garage called Middleton Motors. So he did that did. give you your love of cars? You know, I think it did. When I first passed my test, which I did on, I think, the second time, uh, I got through 12 cars that year because I used to go into the garage and say uh, to dad, oh, can I have that car? And then I I turn over a, a mini van I had and I turned it over and smashed it all. So I had to have a new one after that. And it's so much so that the insurance company said to me, I'm afraid we're going to have to charge you 10 shillings every time you change your car because you're changing them so many times. So, uh, I mean, I, I do love cars, I have to say. I mean, I really do. So your clearing then is a car of choice. So do you want to be in your current car, which is a Fiat convertible or, or pick a car in your life that you most enjoyed being in? No, I think the car that I would have from choice uh, is the is a top of the range Bentley. I think that would be wonderful. And the, of one thing, the one thing I would love and the first thing I'm going to do when I win the lottery is get a chauffeur. I think the idea <laughs> of a chauffeur and you say to him, uh, James, uh, take me to the Delaunay and we'll have I'm having lunch and then pick me up at two o'clock or two thirty. I just think that is just to die for that's so delicious the fact that i'm going to show for you through see what i'm doing here in your bentley of the clearing which is lovely i'm going to show for you through the rest of your journey now right great so we're in your convertible bentley 
vehicle of choice. I'll be your chauffeur if I may. And now I arrive with a tree. Christopher begins to shake your tree to see which storytelling apples fall out. So uh, this is the second bit of preparation where you're now going to tell us four things that have shaped you, please. Well, four things that have shaped me, I suppose. The first thing I have to say are my parents. I mean, I was an only child uh, until I was 18 years old and I was leaving home. Uh, I've been in Salisbury Rep where I met David Wood, who you mentioned earlier. And David and I became really good friends. And I, I was at Salisbury Rep with him and Stephanie Cole was in the company. And she said I should go to drama school. So I applied for the Bristol Old Vic, which she suggested I should go to. I got in and I went off when I was 18 years old to Bristol. And as I was leaving, my mother said to me, oh, she said uh, they were from the West Country. She said, oh, by the way, she said, uh, I'm pregnant. And I said, don't be so stupid. I mean, the thought of, you know, I was 18 years old, my parents still doing it was ghastly. <laughs> I can't tell you, I was horrified. And so I do have a, a brother who's 18 years younger than me called okay. Sean, who is adorable, but he's not like a brother, he's a friend. Uh, is your brother uh, an ambulance driver? Did I get that right? Yes, my goodness, your research is fantastic. Yes, he's an ambulance driver, which he loves. So, so anyway, the first, yeah, first bit of shape is then your parents, yeah. Next and bit. They, they paid for my education. They sent me to a private school because I had a great auntie Vi, who was a great snob. And she insisted I have elocution lessons, which I did. That's why I talk like I do now. And But they were worked really hard. My father worked all day, all night, practically. My mother, the same. And they, they did that to, to make my life better. And they succeeded. And they are truly magnificent uh, creatures who sadly are no longer with us. And your father obviously had to work hard because he's giving you, he's turning you over 12 cars a year. <laughs> <laughs> So the second big of, bit of shapage now. Well, I suppose I have to really give that to Mrs. Christian, who when I went to my private school, which my parents paid for, she was the elocution mistress that taught me how to speak uh, the Queen's English. And also she saw in me something that um, she thought there was an actor in me, I think. So she encouraged that. So. I uh, I was able to, she gave me all sorts of wonderful roles at school and uh, she she got me ready for my first job, which was Salisbury Rep. And bearing in mind that those days, reps were fantastic places for actors. And I feel very sorry for actors nowadays who can't actually use that anymore because it doesn't exist. I mean, you know, the training ground is fantastic. And so she enabled me to go to Salisbury Rep and say, Mr. Salzburg, uh, can you give me a job? And uh, he said, yes, you can come for two shows. No, one show. You can come for one show, uh, which I did. And then I stayed for two years. I was on two pounds a week, heavily <laughs> subsidized by my parents. And I used to do I used to love propping, going out and getting the props. And often my parents would come and see the play. And there was more of their home on the stage than there was a back at home. <laughs> and, you know, I used to take everything. And uh, so I was very, very lucky. And, and that, you know, certainly was my, Mrs. Christian has to be there. Lovely. She's number two shapage. Uh, third thing that shaped you? Well, I suppose it has to be a man called Nat Brenner. Because Nat, our year was a particularly young year. And um, we had a, a couple of actors who fell in love and uh, got married and I became their, was their best man. And uh, I went on their honeymoon and he was, uh, and it finished a year later, the marriage, and I had to go and separate all the presents and give them back to people. Anyway, uh, we, uh, I went on their honeymoon and which, which was lovely. It wasn't but... Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, I'm joking. <laughs> no, 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 no. That, that would be wonderful if it was. But it was <laughs> almost, almost as grand as that. But the, she was an actress who was fantastic and she was going to be a big, big star. And he was really a joke, if you like. Um, but anyway, so they got married and they separated and she then went back to her doctor, previous boyfriend, and married him and had three, two or three children by him. And the other one was a man called Jeremy Irons who went on to win Oscars. And, you know, and it, it was incredible because he, and that Brenner could see talent. I mean, he was extraordinary. It may not have been the sort of talent you thought, 
But there was something about, and I became very friendly with his wife. And if you remember, they lived above the theatre school yes. uh, in Clifton. And I spent most of my time upstairs gossiping with her. He would come up and we'd have wonderful chats. And uh, it was a, a, a marvellous two years of my life. So I'd have to say Nat Brenner has to be there because it, it, it was, he groomed me, I think, into the, what I am today. And just to go back a step, it wasn't, it, was it Jeremy, you weren't describing Jeremy Irons as the joke, or were you? Was that the irony? Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yeah, it was, yes. Blimey. Yes. And he, you know, and he wasn't really, you know, you, you wouldn't have said, oh, this man's going to earn a, uh, an Oscar one day. Yes. Uh, but he did. And, you know, he proved us all wrong. But he was an adorable man. And I still love him. And I still see him. And he's, he's great. And funny enough, I introduced him to his second wife, Sinead Cusack. Uh, because we did a show called London Assurance uh, in the West End, which we took from uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company. And next door to us was a show called um, uh, Godspell, Mm -hmm. in which Jeremy played the lead. uh, Well, uh, one of the leads in that. So that's how they met. And I introduced Mm -hmm. them. So he's got two marriages to thank me for. No, uh, a fourth one just shaped me. I think Alan Boyd, uh, who was a uh, producer with ITV. Uh, I was doing pantomime in Newcastle. I was doing Mother Goose, funny enough. And he came up to see me and took me out for dinner and said, they're doing a show, uh, a variety show with a difference. And it was called Surprise, Surprise. And he very much liked me to play uh, one of the uh, presenters of it. And I was so excited uh, that I couldn't believe it. I really didn't take it in. You know, I was sort of rather low key about it because it was going to be a a major weekend television series for London Weekend Television. And I was going to be one of the presenters out of two. And at the end of it, he said, I'm interested that you haven't asked who the other presenter is. And I said, oh, God, I'm sorry. What? Who is the other presenter? And he said, Scylla Black. Well, I couldn't believe it because Scylla Black was an icon to me. I mean, she was extraordinary I mean I I can't say that I grew up with her but I did grow up with her you know I mean I knew her and I knew the fact that she had retired semi-retired to have children and she brought up her three boys magnificently then she came back on a Wogan show and she made such an impact that's where London Weekend decided to give her this show and decided to ask me to co-host with her and that was the most extraordinary thing and I, I always think that Alan was saw obviously something in me and I, I'll never forget because it, it then propelled me into another yet another field you know which I absolutely adored it's um, the instinct for the chemistry of a double act isn't it I'm hearing there yes I, I think like so. the Morecambe and Wise in the lift Scylla Black yeah. and Christopher Biggins it, it's yes absolutely and we did get on so well and I became really good friends of hers and I was devastated when she died. I, I was devastated when Bobby died. And we went out that day that he died to be with her and uh, her children. And uh, it was it was very, very upsetting uh, because he did everything for her. And I remember the first time we went out, she said she gave me her credit card and she said, you paid for the dinner tonight. And I said, no, what do you mean? We'll all go Dutch. She said, what's, what's Dutch? And I said, well, Dutch is where we all pay for ourselves. Oh, no, Bobby would have hated that. I said, but that's how what life is now. And she gave me the credit card and we didn't use it. We did all go Dutch. And um, but she she was completely lost. He did everything for her. When I went home after the day he died and she rang me at midnight in tears because she didn't know how to feed the dogs. Wow. Uh, You know, he, he was the most extraordinary man. And he he really made and created this star and put her on a pedestal. And she she didn't carry money. She didn't do anything. He did everything. And he was a wonderful man. So that would be my fourth. Yes, the fourth shaping. Lovely. Thank you for that. And so now we're on to three things that inspire you. So if there's any overlap, don't worry about that, because they could all be of a similar ilk. But three things that inspire you now. Interesting. Inspire is a very interesting word. Um, I'm inspired by a girlfriend of mine who is called Trisha Guild. And she has a design shop called Designers Guild. And she uh, married one of my best friends called Richard Polo, 
who uh, had a restaurant called Joe Allen's and he brought it from New York to London and uh, overnight I have to perhaps include Richard as well as Tricia but overnight he they changed my life because up until then I thought that eating in a restaurant you did when you were hungry I had no idea that there was a social side to eating <laughs> And certainly Joe Allen's blew London apart because you used to go there and the place was heaving. Everybody was there. Everybody in show business because it opened late. The food was very simple and brilliant. Uh, it was just wonderful. You go there and you'd meet friends. I mean, sometimes I'd go there and it would take me an hour before I got to my seat because I'm saying hello to people. Mm. And so it, it was extraordinary. And, and then he married Trisha. And Trisha is a wonderful, wonderful interior designer. And I, we most of our house is full of her stuff. And she is an inspiration because uh, he sadly died, Richard. And she really looked after him in an unusual way, in a way that you'd never thought she would. But she did. And she was also working very hard and, and, and not only looking after him, but looking after their homes and everything. And she is extraordinary. I mean, her energy and her um, talent is huge. So uh, they have to be there at the top of that list, I think. Second influencer or influencing element? I suppose uh, I love actresses. And I've had the pleasure of working with some wonderful actresses, uh, namely Judy Dench, who uh, is extraordinary. She taught me how to remember people's names, like you all should, should always repeat uh, the name, uh, Christian name and surname. So if you're in, introduced to Christopher Biggins, you go, Christopher Biggins, you repeat it. How are you, Christopher? You know, and so that sort of goes in for that moment. And it, that was very clear. But also she was unbelievable we were lucky enough we were doing a season at the rsc at the aldwich and we were lucky enough to be doing a wonderful season london assurance which was an incredible production which we then transferred to the west end uh there was uh 12th night henry the eighth with peggy ashcroft and donald sinden there was um uh, it was several others and it was a wonderful season but judy got married to Michael Williams at, the, at a matinee of, before the matinee of Twelfth Night. And uh, that night she came on stage for the curtain call and all of us threw confetti over her. And the whole audience went wild. I mean, they really did. It was extraordinary. One of those wonderful moments you'll never forget. And she she deserved that. She deserves everything she gets. I mean, I think it's wonderful that she's suddenly become a huge film star. Uh, she's so generous in her time. Uh, you know, the fact now that she can't see is just awful. But, you know, if you go up and say, hi, Judy, it's big. And she'll go, big is, how are you? you know, mm -hmm. She is so enthusiastic with life. That is what's so marvellous about her. I've just seen her in the Sondheim repeat of the programme that was made oh, last year, singing Bring, Bring on the Clowns. I mean, just wonderful. Brilliant. I mean, I was lucky enough to be there in the theatre seeing her. Right. And it was one of the great, but I thought the whole thing was wonderful, didn't you? Absolutely. Beautiful. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, Cameron is, uh, he's, have I got one more to go? You have. Yeah. Well, so Cameron would be, would, would be the last one because... Um, I've known Cameron for nearly 50 years and I used to, uh, as an actor, used to work for him in the office. And in those days, we would rob one production to pay another production. And <laughs> I remember we did a, a, a rock nativity, which we opened in, um, oh, Newcastle at the Theatre Royal. And it was pretty much a disaster, I can't tell you, and the, the technical in those days, there were no uh, mics, you know, radio mics. It was all mics on leads. And at the end of Act One, when Jesus is suddenly born, uh, Mary was tangled up with about another 50 mics. And she was on the floor, staggering to get a, a, her mouth around this mic. And in an exasperation, she threw the baby Jesus <laughs> in the air and it slid down the cross arch. And I can't tell you, it's one of the greatest moments ever. And Cameron 
has the best sense of humour. And even though he could see this production leaving him and, and, and failing miserably, we n- never stopped laughing. I mean, it was the funniest thing. And Cameron is, uh, has been such a friend of mine. And he's, uh, I suppose, I'm his oldest friend in a way. And uh, we have the same sense of humour. We see each other and speak to each other all the time. He is incredibly kind and generous. And he's wonderful. And I couldn't be more pleased with his success. I mean, his success is phenomenal. I mean, he's the greatest theatre producer we've ever had. And, and, you know, to have musicals, which we will never see happen again, mm. lasting 35, 40 years, is extraordinary. Mm. I mean, you know, he, and, you know, when you think the start of all that was Les Mis, and Les Mis was given a very, at the Barbican when it opened, and I went to the first night and absolutely adored it. But the critics and a lot of the public hated it. But he wasn't going to be put off by that. I think he spent a lot of money. He knew that it was a show that would run, not 30 odd years, but it would run. And he persisted. And he and he everybody said, no, don't transfer it. You'll lose everything. And he told them to fuck off. And he absolutely (laughs) did it. And it was only him that made that show the phenomenal success and made him, you know, the, 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 the producer of the decade, I mean, or, or of a century. I the mean, tenacity, courage, and just the conviction to tell them to, you know. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And that is what makes him so great, you know. He, and he has had the odd flop here and there, but it doesn't matter. I think that makes him an even better man than he is. But he's, and he also adores, I mean, we talked about the Side by Side by Sondheim, which is on television recently. It was a great, great show. And of course, Sondheim was a good friend of his. And they, again, had a wonderful link with humour. And they would go uh, on holiday together. And it, it, was, it was just wonderful. And Sond- Sondheim is the greatest lyricist songwriter ever. I mean, some of his songs. And I, I remember that um, he wrote a, a musical, Merrily We Roll Along. And I saw Merrily We Rode Along in New York in, in a preview. And I was lucky enough because after the preview, it lasted a week and it came off. But it, was, it is, to me, the greatest musical ever. It's mm. just phenomenal. And that was Stephen Sondheim. And once again, you know, he was advised by people that he, oh, I don't know how he was advised. But anyway, it came off and I don't think it should have done. It was just, but there's a wonderful documentary, by the way. Uh, on te- on one of the channels, uh, and it's a fabulous documentary about the making of it, mm. the failure of it, and it's it's really worth watching. Um, but it it was a fantastic show, and he you know he was another good friend of Cameron's, and Cameron is extraordinary, and I love him dearly, and we're the bestest of friends, which is lovely. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. And now we're on to two things that never fail to grab your attention. So this is borrowed from the film Up. This is, oh, squirrels, if that is a reference that is uh, familiar to you. What never fails to get your attention, whatever else is going on for you in your hectic life. Well, um, I suppose beauty um, I think, you know, there's there's something about, uh, I mean, you, you know, I'm gay and uh, there, I've been blessed with having a lot of lovers in my life who have been beautiful. And I think beauty is terrific. I mean, I, I, I think it, it can also be awful. I think it can, it can put people on a different line. But beauty is very nice to have someone beautiful on your arm is truly wonderful. And I think it gives you the courage and the tenacity to be able to live life to the full in a way. And I've always been lucky and I've always had attractive men on my arm. And uh, I, I have now my soulmate. We've been together 36 years, I think. I mean, it's fantastic. Neil is uh, an extraordinary man and he, um, he does everything for me. Now. He's, he's a wonderful carer. I, last year I had, or two years ago, I had a new knee put in. 
and I had a, a new valve put into my heart, and so I'm like Bionic Man. And <laughs> I couldn't have done it without him. I mean, he's been absolutely fantastic. And in my research, uh, am I right in assuming he used to work for British Airways? Is that right? He did work for British Airways, Paul. And uh, so, I, do you mind if I ask? Did you meet on a flight, or is it not quite as obvious? Oh, as that? No, no. Funny enough, what happened was we met in a, in a nightclub in Glasgow. <laughs> and then I'm um, glad I asked. <laughs> and I was with someone else, and it didn't quite work out. But we saw each other, and then yeah, you know, things we didn't see each other for a while. And I was on a flight coming back from Barbados because I was artistic director for three years of a Shakespeare opera season in Barbados. Not a bad job. I remember Nicola McAuliffe. I rang her and said, "Nicola, would you like to come to Barbados for a month?" and uh, <laughs> this amount of money and you do this and you get accommodation and food and you do this and will you direct this and will you star in this? And she said, that's very nice. Thank you. And she was rather low key. And we, the phone went down and what was very nice. she rang back a minute later and she said, um, you did say Barbados, didn't you? And I said, <laughs> I did. she went, ah! <laughs> 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 well, I mean, so, and she was, we had a wonderful time. In fact, she came out, uh, to Barbados with her boyfriend and they got married in Barbados and uh, so that was that was wonderful I mean it, it was a great great job and I, I, I that was a wonderful period of my life. So you've had lots of halcyon days with halcyon windows of opportunity on lubricated hinges opening for you it would yes. seem you're around at the right place at the right time many times over which is a lovely accolade to be able to consider. Yes indeed. and I so in the structure, beauty was the thing that never fails to grab your attention. And so the second squirrel now, what, what never fails to grab your attention as a monster of distraction for you? Well, I suppose talent, uh, because talent is extraordinary. I mean, you know, you can go. To, I go to the theatre a lot. Uh, I love the theatre. And uh, talent is amazing because you can go and see somebody in a play or a musical or whatever, and they are brilliant. You can go back six months later and see them being appalling. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's extraordinary that, that ha that's what it, the talent is all about, I think. is Because I think if you're good all the time, I think, it, you know, it becomes rather boring. And, you know, we've seen great, great actors. And I worry that we're not breeding eccentrics mm. anymore. And by the way, that's so... Uh, resonant with I read something about James Stewart talking about the moments of magic that you create and it was a, an article about It's a Wonderful Life which of its day I mean it's it's heralded as the greatest Christmas film ever but it of is. its day it, it didn't do very well yeah, and yet it, it, he's proudest classic. of it because of the moments of magic that happened within it yeah no I mean he's quite right I mean that was just a wonderful film uh you know but you know I was privileged uh, to meet uh uh, some very famous people like got John Gilgood and Edith Evans and Ralph Richardson. In fact, I've got a, a Ralph Richardson story, I'll tell you. But first of all, uh, there was a, a, an actress called Athene Siler. Do you ever remember Athene Siler? No, Athe say the name again. Athene, Athene, Athene. Siler. Mm -hmm. So uh, she uh, was in this play. She had third billing to John Gilgood, Ralph Richardson and Edith <laughs> Evans. And the producer, Binky Beaumont, said, look, I'll, I'm going to give you a box. Well, no, that's such a theatre name as well, Binky Beaumont. <laughs> I know, Binky Beaumont, wonderful. <laughs> but, uh, we, so they gave her a box. Uh, so, uh, so it said, Ralph Richardson, John Gielgud, Edith Evans, in whatever the play was. And in the bottom is a box with Athene Siler. So she's thrilled. And she goes to Brighton for the first night. And she gets it. The stage door, there's the poster. All the names are right. And when it gets down to the box, it says, with a tiny sailor. <laughs> <laughs> Same difference, uh, but, different. I know. But my, John, my uh, Ralph Richardson story is, is uh, <laughs> a classic. Uh, he, uh, I, was a I was made a member by Winston Graham, who wrote the Poldark novels. I was a... Uh, uh, he gave me membership of a club called the Savile Club in London. And I was too young, I think, to really appreciate it. I mean, but it was really rather wonderful. And they, if you went in on your own for lunch or dinner, you sat at the table that had singles. So you'd sit there and you'd make conversation with other, other members. And the waitresses weren't allowed to interrupt you to find out what you wanted to have. So he was there for lunch. And at quarter to two, the waitress had to say to him, excuse me, sir, 
but you've not written anything down. What would you like for lunch? And you went, oh, 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 I, I'd like a jam omelette. So <laughs> she said, all right. So she went away and she came back five minutes later and she says, chef says, who's it for? And he said, tell chef it's for Sir Ralph Richardson. And she came back five minutes later and said, chef says no. <laughs> <laughs> And he turned to the man he was dining with and said, who would you have to be to get a jab off? <laughs> <laughs> That's a lovely story. <laughs> and now we could be at a quirky or unusual fact about you we couldn't possibly know until you tell us, Mr Biggins. I really, really enjoy eating out. So the quirky, unusual fact is you like eating out in an I like eating out, yes. Is that quirky enough? That's, that'll do for me. That's awesome. <laughs> OK, now we've shaken your tree. Huzzah. And now we're moving away from the tree, staring in the clearing, staying in the clearing. And we're going to talk about alchemy and gold now. When you're right. at purpose and in flow, begins, what are you absolutely happiest doing? Well, I'm happiest, I think, uh, being with Neil. Uh, we get on so well. We have such a good time. We have rows, of course, but like everybody does. And I love going abroad. I mean, I love travelling. Lovely. Now we're going to award you with a cake. I forgot to oh, ask you I love that. cake. Yes, I love cake. Yes. So what's the, what's the cake of choice, please? Well, I think, uh, I, I think I'm going to say, and you may, this may be a bit boring, but I love Christmas cake. And I love Christmas cake with marzipan, but not icing. And my great auntie Vi, the snob I was telling you about, she used to make wonderful Christmas cake and the most marvellous marzipan to go on it. And I absolutely love that. I get very upset when they put icing on top of that. I love that she's a terrible snob, but she made great Christmas cake with marzipan. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, and um, could, do you mind if I ask, did you get any, I, I'm not, I don't necessarily perceive you as being one, but because you've mentioned again, she was a terrible snob. And yet, yet you've said, are you a snob is what I'm sort of saying. <laughs> have you got some of that from her? No, I don't think I have funny enough. I mean, I think I'm the most unsnobby person I know. Uh, because I, uh, we have got in our book, our diary, well, not diary, address book, We've got millionaires, we've got working actors, we've got uh, friends who have no money at all. Uh, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's quite eclectic. Mm. And I like that. I like the fact. And I love being friends with millionaires. I mean, that, that is wonderful. I love getting, going on their jets. I love uh, helicopters. I love all the luxury things, you know, and I would quite like that, I suppose. But it's much better, I think, to live vicariously off others. <laughs> <laughs> I love the antidote to snobbery, which is to, to have an eclectic address book. Like <laughs> exactly, exactly. What's the, fa the favourite inspirational quote? That's always oh, right, that's answer. right. Yes, well, I think I have to turn to Oscar Wilde, I think, uh, who uh, was I was very much uh, a fan of. I mean, I think what he, happened to him was just appalling. And there are so many quotes uh, that he gave. Um, and I'm just trying to think of one now. But I, I think that I think nearly everything he quoted was fantastic and meant something to me. And I think meant something to a lot of people, especially gay people. And uh, I will always thank him for that. So uh, is that enough? Yes. It, 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 generally, his quotes are worth looking up is what yes, you're saying. They, so they are, they go are. to Oscar Wilde for all your, all your main inspiration. Exactly. Lovely. And uh, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? The best piece of I've been ever, ever given is Biggins, never stop laughing. Wonderful. And, and I think that is just fantastic. I mean, I laugh all the time. I have a very recognisable laugh. I remember Leslie Joseph and I, who are a great, great friend of mine, we went to see um, the American comedian, um, Oh, I Ruby Wax, are you talking about? No, 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 no. American, American. Oh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, no, no. I'm th no, Joan Rivers, no. Joan Rivers. We yes, thank Joan you. Rivers at the Haymarket Theatre. And Leslie and I got a review in Times uh, <laughs> for our laugh. <laughs> and I'm thrilled at that because she was, and I met her, I had dinner with her at Joan Collins's uh, one night and uh, she was quite quiet, which I found interesting. 
And at the end of the evening, she said, Christopher, she said, do you like shopping? So I said, yes, I do. She said, would you like to shop with me tomorrow? So I said, I'd love to. So I went shopping in uh, the markets in London and we had the best time. And she was just fantastic. Uh, a real inspiration. And I think laughter is wonderful. I mean, I can't think of anything better than having a good laugh. And do you remember who said it to you? It's obviously manifested beautifully, but who said, Biggins never stop laughing? I can't remember who said it. I think several people have said it to me. Mm. And, I, and I, I take it on board and I, I will never stop laughing. I mean, mm. I always, and I think Joan Collins is in Los Angeles at the moment and we were talking um, the other day on the phone and I said, are you having a nice day? She said, I am. She said, but they're not as funny over here. Oh. I mean, you know, we, I, we love going out with you because you're funny. And I think that was a great accolade, really a lovely thing to say because I do love there's nothing like a good laugh. And obviously it's uh, Dame Jones' 90th coming up soon. Are you obviously going to be sort of, you know, man of honour at the party? Well, I, I've, I've done her wedding and I've done her last birthday and I've done their anniversary, so I'm sure I will be. I mean, it, it, she is, she's the most extraordinary woman I've ever met. I mean, she is brilliant. I mean, she is so kind. She is funny. Uh, she uh, she once again enjoys life to the full mm. and she's had the most amazing life she's had almost the most amazing life as Christopher Biggins Dame Christopher Biggins and Dame Joan how wonderful <laughs> lovely uh, so now I think we could be at the point of uh, Shakespeare and all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players how when all is said and done Christopher Biggins would you most like to be remembered well, I think I'd like to be remembered, and I'm, I'm sorry to repeat this, uh, for my joy of life and my laughter. And uh, I think if I, we, on my gravestone, if we could put, he made us laugh, would be fantastic, and a, a, a great epitaph. Thank you. Just doing a bit of silence there deliberately to let that hang. Lovely. And uh, could we now find out um, where we can find out all about One Begins When We Want To on the Internet, please? Oh, right. Well, I think I'm, I'm, I'm Instagram and I think it may be One Begins, O-N-E-B-I-G-G-I-N-S. And I think the same is, is true of uh, Twitter. You know, but it's it's good and it's very nice to have people's reaction to you, you know, and people mm. saying nice things and... We all like nice things, don't we, being said about us. And so it, it's nice to get reassured. And it's been a great pleasure, by the way, chauffeuring you in the open top Bentley <laughs> through the curated <laughs> journey of the Good Listening To show. As this has been your moment in the sunshine in the Good Listening To show, is there anything else you'd like to say, Christopher Biggins? No. Wonderful. So you've been listening to me, Chris Grimes, but most importantly, this has been. <laughs> and we're leaving you on laughter. <laughs> One begins. Thank you very much indeed, and good night. You've been listening to the Good Listening To show here on UK Health Radio with me, Chris Grimes. Oh, it's myself. If you've enjoyed the show, then please do tune in next week to listen to more stories from the clearing. If you'd like to connect with me on LinkedIn, then please do so. There's also a dedicated Facebook group for the show, too. You can contact me about the programme, or if you'd be interested in experiencing some personal impact coaching with me, care of my Level Up Your Impact programme, that's chris at secondcurve.uk. On Twitter and Instagram, it's... At that Chris Grimes. So until next time, from me, Chris Grimes, from UK Health Radio, and from Stan... To your good health. And goodbye.